Good morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1. We'll start in the first verse. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Let us pray. Righteous Father, we thank You for this day that You've given us and our time together to worship You. Father, we bring You praise, honor, and glory. Not least, Father, because of what You have done through Your Son. But Father, You have sent Him to die for us so that we might be sprinkled with His blood and that we might learn obedience through Him and that we might learn who we are. Father, help us to embrace our identity in Christ, to value it over all other identities, to see ourselves in light of the exile, of the dispersion. And Father, help us to understand who we are in Christ. It's in His name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so this morning we're going to start a new study in First Peter. And I want us to start with the distinct way that Peter addresses his audience. I want you to think about this for a minute. When you're making introductions with someone, when you're getting to know someone, how do you identify yourself? What are the sorts of things that we normally ask starting out? When you're just getting to know someone, what do you want to know about the other person and what do you want them to know about yourself? Now, in our culture, it almost always boils down to just a handful of things, uh, particularly occupation. What is it that you do to make money? Because that's what we're primarily concerned with. How do you fill your time? Uh, and so we, you know, we talk about what we do for a living. And we might stretch that out to, you know, where are you from? Especially down here in Florida. Because you've got to ask that because nobody is from Florida. Um, you know, well, I guess there are. But we're always surprised to find out, right? Down here you meet just as many people from other places all over the country. New York, Michigan, Ohio, you know, West Virginia. All over the place. All over the place. And we want to know that sort of thing. And we identify ourselves by those things. We identify ourselves as, oh, I am a, you know, I'm a retired administrator, or I am a, you know, I'm a preacher, I'm an artist, I, you know, work in insurance, I do this, that, or the other thing. I'm an engineer. We identify ourselves that way. And we identify ourselves according to these other, uh, these other things that we pick up for ourselves. Uh, we might think of ourselves, you know, I think we all think of ourselves as Americans. Uh, we take pride in being Americans. Uh, but we also usually will kind of subdivide ourselves. We might think of ourselves as Southerners, like true Southerners. Uh, we might think of ourselves as Yankees. We might think of ourselves as Mid- Midwesterners. I happen to be proud of that. So, go Sherman. And I say that in the South as often as I can. Um, especially in Georgia. You know, we think of ourselves according to those things and we take pride in them. I want us to look at how Peter addresses his audience. He doesn't say to you Christians... He doesn't even single out a particular church. Now, he names several areas where uh, we suspect his letter was to be circulated. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, But he's not inviting his audience to think of themselves primarily as people of Pontus, or Galatians, or Cappadocians, or Asians, or Bithynians. He addresses his letter to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Or depending on your translations, those who are of the elect exiles of the dispersion. Or sojourners in the diaspora. You might have all sorts of words there. 
not addressing, again, one particular congregation. He's addressing a whole host of congregations across uh, the Roman province of Asia Minor. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And he calls them of the elect exiles of the dispersion. They're not all of the elect exiles of the dispersion. They're some of the elect exiles. This title that Peter is using of his particular audience, the ones who would have first received his letter in circulation, uh, the ones who would have listened to it first being read in their congregations. He's not just addressing them as elect exiles. This is something that is characteristic of all Christians, regardless of congregation. That means us here at 14th Avenue in St. Petersburg, Florida in 2018. You and I are of the elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not frequently introduce myself that way. Oh, hey, I'm Caleb. Oh, what do you do, Caleb? Oh, I'm, I'm of the elect exiles of the dispersion. Okay. You know, because you, that's the sort of reaction that you're going to get. But if Peter is addressing us this way, if Peter, who introduces himself as an apostle of Christ, that is one sent out by Christ with the message of Christ, if he is calling us that, we need to be thinking of ourselves as that. So if we're supposed to think of ourselves this way, as being of the elect exiles of the dispersion, well, what does it mean? I mean, just just first off, what does that phrase even mean, the elect exiles of the dispersion? And how does our identity, how does what we think of ourselves change whenever we look at ourselves as elect exiles of the dispersion or elect sojourners of the diaspora? How does it change the way that we look at the world around us and other people? How does it change the way that we live out in the world among other people? How do we relate to the world? How does it change our behavior? Not just the way that we think, but the way that we act. Now we've spent a lot of our time in Bible class recently studying from the books of Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah. We should have some sense of what Peter is referring to whenever he refers back to the elect exiles of the dispersion. We know who the exiles were. The exiles were those people who were dispossessed of their homes by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And remember what happened. uh, That Judah, on account of its sins, was punished by God. God sent King Nebuchadnezzar. He sent the Babylonians to besiege the city of Jerusalem, to capture it, to capture its people, to cart them off to Babylon, and to destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, destroy the walls. Everything that used to be Judah was no more. And the only people who were left behind were the very poor. And they were only left behind to tend the land. Everyone else became an exile. They had no earthly kingdom. They had no earthly power. And they had no earthly hope. And the first thing that the exiles had to learn how to do, and one of the first things that Peter is going to invite us to learn from them, is that they had to keep the faith in a nation that was hostile to it. Think about some of the first exiles. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. What sorts of torments and trials did they have to face? Daniel chapter 1. They are tempted with this diet of the king's rich foods. And Daniel, remember, purposes in his heart not to defile himself with it. And the, the chief eunuch tries to force them into it. Uh, and Daniel says, no, we're not going to do it. Of course, you know, that's not 
I don't know, some of us might consider a diet to be difficult. Uh, because remember, his diet was only vegetables and water. Some of us might consider that to be a hard trial. Uh, but the real trials came afterward. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in Daniel chapter 3 are threatened with death in the burning fiery furnace. And indeed, they are thrown into the burning fiery furnace. And you remember why? Because Nebuchadnezzar carts them all out into the plain of Dura before the city of Babylon and he has set up this golden image and he commands them all to bow down and worship it. And the question is laid just bald right in front of them. Will you keep the faith or not? Will you stay faithful to God or will you abandon Him? for your own safety, your own well-being. Now, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are not the only exiles confronted with that question. They're the only ones that we read about in Daniel chapter 3. But they were not the only ones challenged in that way in Babylon. Because remember, Babylon had their own gods. They had Marduk. Right. They had Bel. Uh, they had uh, all of the, the gods and goddesses surrounding them. Uh, they had Nabu. There were all sorts of idols that the exiles were invited to worship. Right. Because whenever you're... Well, you know what the old phrase is. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. When in Babylon, you do as the Babylonians do. And that means to fit in, do you, do you worship the way that they worship? You look like they look. And remember, they, they even tried to do this to Daniel and his friends in the very first chapter. They gave them Babylonian names. Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You are going to become Babylonian. And these friends keep the faith. It's a tall order. Because think about it. If they're in this hostile country asked to keep the faith, think about it this way. How well did Israel do at keeping the faith when they had their own country? When they were free to worship as they ought. When they were free to keep the faith without fear of persecution, at least ostensibly. Israel was God's chosen people. Whenever the kingdom was divided, they were still His chosen people. God sent them prophets. The temple was still in Jerusalem. Worship was still there. How well did they do when they had all of that? And now... And because Remember, that's the reason they went into exile to begin with. Because they failed miserably at it. And so they're carted off into exile. And there, when they had failed in their own home country, there they are asked, keep the faith in the midst of a hostile people. Now this should sound familiar to us. This should be one area where we should understand what it means for us to be part of the elect exiles of the dispersion. Because that's us today. Our country was settled by Christian men. They wrote our constitution and our laws to allow us all sorts of latitude to worship God. And even today, even today, you know, did any of us wake up this morning and as we were getting dressed for church, worry to ourselves about whether or not we were going to face stiff persecution on the way to church or as we were worshiping today? Not so much. As a country, what have we done with those blessings? What have we done with the founders being it to, to lose it to use the term loosely, uh, the founders being Christian men? What have we done with the First Amendment? 
Not what have the heathen been doing to us. All right, we could spend all day talking about uh, talking about the government putting restrictions on the exercise of religion in the public sphere. Uh, we could talk about unbelievers who have spent decades trying to drive the faith out of the public square. I mean, what did Christians do with the freedoms that our fathers gave us by the grace of God? Have American Christians, by and large, been faithful? Consider that the divorce rate in this country among those who call themselves Christians is not different from the divorce rates among those who don't call themselves Christian. Likewise, and this this really shocked me, I want you to consider this. The Pew Research Center takes a poll every year um, asking people about their, their opinions on abortion. And it's a really simple poll. Their questioning could be a lot better. Um, they basically ask, do you believe that abortion should be legal in most or all cases, or do you believe that abortion should be illegal in most or all cases? Uh, so they, they pare it down to just those two options. And then they also collect some really simple demographic data. Um, you know, gender, basic age range, um, ethnicity. They don't even they don't even collect like education data. Wait, no, they collect education data. They don't collect wage data. So you can't even break it down according to like who earns what sort of wage. Uh, but they ask also, do you? Uh, what is your religious affiliation? Um, and they break it down according to white evangelical Protestant, black Protestant, Roman Catholic, uh, mainline Protestant, and unaffiliated. So a few, you know, broadly speaking, again, loosely speaking, Christian traditions and everybody else. So they conducted the poll. They do this every year. And in 2017, the Pew Research Center found that opposition to abortion only outweighs support for abortion among evangelical Protestants. Only in you know, denominations like the Southern Baptist Convention. Only in those denominations does, uh, does opposition to abortion outweigh support for abortion. Among every other segment of professing Christians that they polled, Roman Catholics, mainline Protestants, everybody, support for abortion, public support for abortion, outweighed opposition to it. Like we're living out Israel's story. Israel didn't keep the faith when they held power. People who call themselves Christians in the United States frequently do not keep the faith when they hold power. But once the faithful of Judah were stripped of their homes and their sovereignty, God required them to keep the faith in a hostile land. And even though we read these stories about many of the faithful keeping the faith, you know, Daniel and his friends, for example, we know that many of them did not keep the faith. We studied this morning in our Bible class of this winnowing process that the Lord engages in. Uh, just to, for those of you that weren't here this morning, turn to Zechariah chapter 13. We're going to read verses 7 through 9. Zechariah 13, 7 through 9. The Lord says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested." They will call upon my name and I will answer them. And I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. The Lord winnows His people down. And by the way, notice here that the, at the beginning of this bit of prophecy, the sheep are scattered. 
The other word that we have for scattered or people who are scattered is dispersion or diaspora. Whenever Peter is addressing the elect exiles of the dispersion or the diaspora, what he means is the elect exiles of all of God's faithful people who have been scattered out. Right? Because... Uh, in Peter's day, there were more Jews living outside of Judea than there were living inside of Judea by a margin of about two or three to one. Two to three times as many Jews living outside of Judea as there were living inside of Judea. Kind of like how the Irish are today. There's like 50 bajillion times more Irish people outside of Ireland than there are inside of Ireland. The Lord prophesies here His people are going to be scattered. They're going to be dispersed over the earth. They're spread out everywhere. There's not, there is no single country that has a monopoly on God's people. And likewise, there is no single country in which God's people have a monopoly. In other words, no country on this earth can identify itself as God's chosen and elect nation. No nation on this earth can say, God picked us out. And likewise, there's no country on this earth where God's faithful can say, honestly and truthfully, we've got control of this place. Because again, look around. Do do we have control of this country? Not a chance. Is it going to happen? Don't hold your breath. Please. I know you want to get to heaven, but not that quickly. The prophecy here says two-thirds of the sheep are cut off and perish. Only a third survive. Brethren, we are living in a world that is getting increasingly hostile to the faith. And it may be better to say that it's growing more overtly hostile to the faith. The world is now naming the faith, naming us, our beliefs, our practices as its enemy. That's a a relatively recent development, at least in our corner of the world. The people in the public square commonly holding the idea that Christians are the problem. The church is the problem. But it's only more overt now. The world has always been hostile to the faith, even whenever it hasn't looked hostile to us. And by the way, that's that's the riskiest. When we don't see how hostile the world is to us, we think that we're chummy with the world and the world is chummy with us. It's easy to have this good old days mentality. Right About this time, this mythical time in the U.S., when the faith was honored, everybody was righteous. You remember that time, right? When everybody in the U.S. was good and faithful uh, and didn't act like the heathen around them? We can at least say that the faith was superficially acceptable, but that world was hostile too, only in different ways. Maybe there wasn't anybody back then saying, bake the cake, bigot. But there were plenty of people back then saying, you can have your cake and eat it too. And there were plenty of Christians saying, yes, please. For all of its wonderful qualities, our country has been incredibly materialistic for decades. It's not a recent development. Our culture encourages us to trust in possessions and in power rather than in the living God. The gospel demands that we look out to the margins. Remember, who is it? When you go to Matthew 25, when you look at the judgment, what is it that we're being judged on the basis of? Go on to Matthew 25. I think we should always have this sitting in the back of our minds whenever we're thinking about who we are and the way that we behave in this world. Look 
at what the Son of Man is asking. In Matthew 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He'll separate people one from the other as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry Hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, that is, I was a sojourner. I was a wanderer in exile. I was that and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. All right, now we get. There are lots of measures of righteousness throughout Scripture. All right, it's not just like one short list of things that we've got to be concerned with. But certainly it counts for something that whenever Jesus was describing the judgment, the Son of God is describing the judgment, the criteria that He picked out are these. Have you been taking care of people who are sick, people who are naked, people who are in prison, people who are sojourners, wanderers, exiles, people who are hungry and thirsty? Those are the criteria right there. Does our culture teach us to do that? Does the world invite us to do that? The Gospel says we look to the margins. We look to the poor. We look to the disabled. Our corner of the world says, uh uh-uh, you look to yourself. You look out for number one. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself first. It's funny, the sorts of words that that we've invented in English. Your language tells you a lot about who you are, like as a culture. Um, I found out yesterday that uh, in Japanese, in Chinese, and in Korean, all three of those languages, they each have a word, a single word, uh, that means death by overwork. Right? It's the condition where you die because you worked too much. That tells you something about those cultures. We don't have a similar word, by the way. There is no word in English that means death by overwork. If you want to express that, you have to say death by overwork. We don't have a name for it. You know what we do have a name for? Self-care. That is a named thing, and it covers a broad spectrum of activities, all of which is about making sure that I'm okay, that I am taken care of, because I've got to have my needs met first before anything else can happen. It tells you something about our culture, that we have such a word. And it is one word because it's hyphenated, self-care. In this hostile world, and by the way, that's that's continuing. Now we've got bake the cake bigot added on top of that. All right, take care of yourself, and also your belief system is bigoted and evil, and you're just as bad as the Nazis. All right, that's being added together in our culture. In this hostile world, how do we remain faithful to the Lord? How do we survive this winnowing process, the two-thirds of the sheep being cast out? How do we pass through the refining fire and see to the other side? And remember, things didn't change for Judah once they returned home. Right, after the decree of Cyrus, after the Jews got to go back to Jerusalem and start rebuilding the temple, start rebuilding the walls, things didn't change for them. The times and the places changed, but the circumstances remained the same. They remained under the power of Persia, then Greece, then Rome. And they saw themselves as exiles even when they were living in their own homes. Brothers, that's the mentality that we need to develop. That Peter is inviting us to develop. 
that we need to consider ourselves to be strangers, exiles, wanderers in our own homes. I live here, but I don't belong here. All right, and we've got a lot of songs that uh, that capture that sentiment. Right, the old classic, you know, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger while traveling through this world of woe. Right, there's this sense that, you know, or to quote another song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. If we are the elect exiles of the dispersion, it means that we are strangers at home. There's one other thought that I want us to consider. Because Peter's going to be developing this idea over the course of the whole letter. This is Today's sermon is just kind of setting the stage for what Peter wants us to understand um, as we are living out the, the life of the exile. What it looks like on the ground. But I just want us to consider one other passage uh, which we talked about briefly this morning uh, in our Bible class. At the end of Zechariah chapter 14 in verse 16, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. And if any of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. But in the end, part of what is going to characterize God's people... Right, the remnant that he has kept for himself, the remnant that goes up to worship him in his dwelling place, what characterizes them, part of it, is they keep the Feast of Booths. As we talked about this morning, the Feast of Booths represents a period of Israel's history. Turn to Leviticus chapter 23. We're going to see where this is enshrined in the Law of Moses. Leviticus chapter 23. We'll start in verse 33. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. Um, And if we skip down a little bit, uh, go to verse 39. We'll see what they're supposed to be doing and what the motivation is. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Excuse me. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths or tabernacles, tents, for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in tents that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in tents when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Part of what characterizes the remnant, the holy people, the chosen people, that the Lord has winnowed down and refined for Himself, is that they keep this feast. That they remember that God's people are a wandering, homeless people a people bereft of any nation to call their own. And notice the way that they observe this here in Leviticus 23, the the way that it is commanded through Moses. It is not commanded as a period of fasting. It is not commanded as a period of mourning. It is commanded as a feast. 
And it's held at harvest time. So they've got plenty of food available for feasting and celebrating. It's a party. They're rejoicing in who they are as the Lord's wandering vagrants. And they go outside and they camp to remind themselves of who they are. And this is supposed to permeate Israel's identity. Uh, Go to Exodus chapter 22. We see this. The Lord brings this up occasionally as He's giving them commandments. Exodus chapter 22 and verse 21. Moses says, You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. In chapter 23 and verse 9, You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner. In other words, you know what it feels like to be an exile and a wanderer. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. And the Feast of Booths is supposed to, to memorialize that, to capture that and remind them of that year over year that they ought to know what it feels like to be a wanderer. Brethren, do we know what it feels like to be exiles? Or are we too comfy at home? I'm not going to judge anybody's heart here. That's something that I'm inviting you to do. Consider for yourself, am I too comfortable plugged into the identities that this world has provided to me? I think of myself too much as somebody who lives in St. Pete. I think of myself as uh, too much as a Midwesterner or an Illinoisan or, you know, a former teacher or fill in the blank. I think of myself too much like that. I'm too comfortable with that. I don't think of myself as a vagrant and a wanderer. And remember... How we think about ourselves is going to have a huge effect on how we treat others. Why do we not mistreat foreigners, does the law say? Because we know that we're foreigners. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 23. One final reminder. This time against greed. Leviticus 25.23 The Lord commands, The land shall not be sold in perpetuity. Remember, in the the year of Jubilee, all of the, the land that you have bought up, all the land that your family has bought up from other families, you have to give back. No strings attached. It just goes back. You're not getting any money out of it. You are just straight up giving it back for free to whatever family it's supposed to belong to. And the Lord says, and by the way, you, know, you think that's going to hurt your pocketbook? Yeah, you better believe it. The Lord says the land shall not be sold in perpetuity. That's why it goes back. For the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. Don't get greedy, he says. Don't get too attached to your land. What you think belongs to you because you are just a wanderer on this earth, the Lord says. So the call this morning, do we consider ourselves to fit into that paradigm? Do we think of ourselves that way? Now, what are we going to do about it? Now, it's all of this sounds kind of dismal and discouraging. This is a lot of, you know, the Lord is going to be really hard on His people and He's going to refine them in the fire. He's going to scatter them out all over the place. They're going to be homeless. There's one other bit of that description that we did not talk about. Peter doesn't just call us exiles in the dispersion. He calls us elect exiles in the dispersion. In this, we are to take heart. Our homelessness, our strangeness in this world is not an accident. It's not a byproduct. It is God's intention for us. 
It is God's plan for us. But He has picked out the church to be His holy and special people. That He has picked out the church to live this way. And that by living this way, we will be blessed by God. Now remember, whenever you're going into the refining fire, you're going in with all of this detritus, all of this waste. And going into the fire, you think, I don't like the look of that. But what are things like on the other side of the fire, besides the fact that you're no longer in a fire, which is a pretty big positive in and of itself, right? But now you have been refined. All of the garbage, all of what we sometimes call the baggage, is gone. Brother Keith has selected number 441. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. This is a reminder and that God has planned for this. God has picked this out. That God is not passing us by. God's not forgotten about us in our exile, in our wandering. But God is with us and He is storing up our good things for us. It may be that you're here today and you have not taken on that covenant identity as an elect exile of the dispersion. That you have not joined into the new covenant of Christ which He made with His blood. Which we enter through baptism. It may be that you have not done those things. We invite you to enter into that covenant. Right, to join on Jesus' side by repenting of your sins, confessing that He is the Son of God and King of creation, by being baptized into His death, burial, and resurrection. Or it may be that you've entered into that covenant and like a native Israelite, you forgot who you were. You forgot that you were a sojourner. You forgot that your forefathers lived in tents. You forgot that you are not of this world. We invite you to come back from the world and to identify yourself again as an exile. Whatever your need may be, we stand ready and prepared to help. If you'll come forward as together we stand and sing.